Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Good to see everyone here. And try to offer you some uh, really good solid information this morning, keeping your attention. We're not playing Scrabble in this in this meeting, unfortunately. I hope that's not a major letdown for anyone, but uh, but we'll still try and keep it interesting. Where's our Scrabble? Hey, Emilio. Yeah. How you doing? All right, buddy. What's up? Yeah, all right. Do we, do you do registration this semester? I'm I'm still in Indiana. Yeah, I know. I uh, somebody told me. Yeah, so yeah. So you're out there in Kokomo, huh? No, I'm in I'm in Granger. Oh, I know Kokomo. I don't know Granger. <laughs> uh, you didn't go to school out there. You didn't you didn't go to Indiana State, Terre Haute, did you? I went to Ball State. Oh, okay. You were in Muncie. Yeah, I went to Ball State. I knew people that went to Indiana State. I didn't know they would went to Ball State. Yeah, it was it was fun. I grad, of course, I graduated a long time I, ago, almost ten years ago. But I never paid you for a uh, Hoosier. Can you? I am me? a Hoosier. You are. I am a Hoosier. I am. Um. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can. I we can hear you. Oh, really? That's, oh, yeah. okay. So you moved one state over, huh? Who, me? Yeah, one state over. I didn't move. I'm st I still, my address is still in, in is still yeah. Illinois. At least. <laughs> but my sister, but my sister is partially paralyzed. At, at least you. So I have move. to help her. At least oh. you can cross over. Well, yeah, let me I cross can. over the border. I can't get into Ontario. I wanted to go during spring break. That only only mail and uh, trucks can cross over the border. I can't cross through over Buffalo. I can't cross over through. The so <laughs> let me cross. And I won't yeah, be able be, to come back over. Be careful the be careful the Central Time. <laughs> oh, I know. That's what screws me up. We had the meeting at eight forty-five this morning. Okay, and I got up, and that's nine forty-five yeah. our time. I got up at six o'clock in the morning, five o'clock your time, just because of, <laughs> just because I didn't want to screw up the time. Um, we're going to get started as for okay. continue to come in. Um, so wonderful to see all of you. Uh, first of all, happy new year. Happy, happy, new, year. Year. happy new year. Happy new year. On behalf happy of new year. Us, we wish you a joyous and healthy year ahead. Good um, morning. My name is Kevin Lee. I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences. I'm gonna ask Rick and Derek to introduce themselves quickly and then we'll move on to our agenda. Good morning, everyone. This is Rick Segovia, Associate Dean of College Readiness in the area of Arts and Sciences. I'm, I think I'm familiar with most of you. Um, welcome back, Happy New Year. Good Happy to see you. Happy New Year. Thank you, Rick. And I am Derek Salinas Lazarski, I'm the Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences here as well. I recognize both of you and uh, <laughs> Please reach out if you ever need anything. We're always happy to be in contact and put you in. And my secretary and I are happy to put you in contact with whatever help you need on campus. Thank you, um, Rick and Derek. Um, before we go into the actual agenda, in fact, we have two uh, wonderful presentations for you today. 
Uh, but before we go into the uh, presentations, I do want to um, mention a couple house uh, um, rule. Um, if you uh, are aware, um, those who are assigned spring, uh, spring 2021 classes, you should have finished all your Blackboard Learn. Uh, but keep in mind, you will have to also finish the Blackboard pedagogy by the end of this semester. Now, um, the difference is the following. Blackboard Learn, you can go in and then you sell direct that you can finish at your own time. Mm -hmm. However, the pedagogy is not. It's a cohort type of training. So I'm going to ask a Derek to give you Humberto's email address in the chat that when you are ready to join the pedagogy module in Blackboard, please reach out to Humberto ASAP because it's a cohort model. If you don't join enough, soon enough, then you may not even have a spot. So I encourage all of you to reach out to Humberto ASAP. And in addition to that, as another uh, announcement is the following. And obviously uh, many of you uh, heard earlier that um, if you need to go to the campus, there is an app called Campus Clear and you can download it you know, using your Android or iPhone. And uh, every time when you come to the campus, please make sure that you will be uh, using the Clear uh, Campus Clear app and make sure that um, you kind of go through the very, very simple questions and then the software let you know whether you're good to go or not. Okay, so that is the two little announcements this morning. Uh, next, I would like to introduce to you the agenda today. We're gonna cover two uh, uh, important topic this morning during our little time together. Uh, first, you will hear from our um, Chancellor Center Director, Nelly Masio, and she's gonna give you an update on our Chancellor Center, which is a wonderful resource for our students. You know, whether they are arts and sciences, whether they are CTE, um, you know, program, if students want to transfer after they, they study with us, they will be getting a lot of help and wonderful resources from the Chancellor Center. The second half of our meeting today, um, um, we will be talking about the W rate at Triton College. Uh, Beth Dung, one of the co-chair in the math department, she was going to present to you, however, due to a family um, emergency, we will play a video of her presentation for you today. And after that uh, video presentation, we will have some opportunity for you to kind of talk through what idea you may have to collectively bring down the W withdrawal rate you know, at Triton College. So we'll do a little um, you know, exercise in the chat area to get your input that way. How does this sound, everyone? Sounds great, Kevin. Thank you. It's my pressure to um, introduce Excellent. you, Nelly Masio. And that, uh, Derek, if you may, um, can you give Nelly access for her to... Um... So I'm working on it, Kevin. IT said I would be a host, and I am not currently a host. So I'm working on some of the tech issues, and they're not in the chat. So... Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I did send them a reminder uh, earlier too, and I just sent an email right now. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they told me I would be a host as well, because I have to share the, the video. And so, Perfect. is anyone surprised that we have a minor tech issue? I thought we were going <laughs> to you know, clean through this giant remote meeting with you all with nothing. And of course, Never a dull day. <laughs> right. So we're working on it, but we're going to make it work. We're going to make it oh, work. Oh, I, I have access now. Great. Excellent. I see that. Perfect. Okay, thank Great you. Great timing. Go ahead. Okay. Hello everyone. It's nice to see you. Can you see my um, my screen? Yes. 
Okay, perfect. So we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Nellie Marcial. I'm the director of the Transfer Center. Nancy Guzman couldn't be here today. Uh, however, uh, she is our transfer specialist and we're very lucky to have her on our team. So just a little more background on what the Transfer Center is. I'm actually in the Transfer Center right now because I'm helping with registration. Um, the Transfer Center is, uh, has been funded through the Title V grant for Hispanic serving institutions as of fall 2019. We had our grand opening in spring 2020, uh, and then shortly a couple months later, COVID happened. So unfortunately, we haven't been able to use the facility to its full extent. But while we were on campus, we had a lot of support. As you can see, this is one of my favorite pictures because these are all a lot of our university partners that came out to support that day. We also had adjuncts, faculty uh, as, as, as well, so you might recognize some of your colleagues there. Uh, we have two full-time staff that are funded through the grant, and that is myself as well as Nancy. We often have a work study as well as interns who assist us with the front desk and special projects. Um, our, our work is really um, relying on a lot of the resources on campus because we are only a team of two. Um, and we also have a transfer center cohort that we monitor uh, just as a, a pilot group to make sure that we are in compliance with the grant when it comes to the retention and completion metrics that we're constantly uh, measuring. And uh, our events continue remotely. We're not able to host um, in-person events for many reasons, uh, primarily safety, but the good thing is that we are still doing everything remotely. So I do wanna break down uh, the transfer cohort, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it is a, a cohort of currently uh, three, 300 students from last year and 400 students from this year. So a total of about 700. Uh, Nancy, our transfer specialist oversees this cohort. And as you can see, uh, there is a priority to focus on students that are considered um, uh, students of color as well as first gen, Pell eligible. Uh, the, the, you can see some of the progress between the two cohorts uh, for fall 2020 being that it is the most recent cohort. We may not have as many approved um, academic plans or research on them yet, but if you see in the early outcomes next to it, you'll see that based on um, your uh, other typical uh, iPad student. Uh, we are in the transfer center uh, excelling when it comes to the retention rates by 76% versus 63% in the college. We also have an average of more credit hours earned as well as a higher GPA and more academic plans uh, in our system, which as you know is, is required. We wanna be very, um, intrusive with our students when it comes to advising them. I think some of the things that I've seen really work with our cohort is that they get a lot of uh, very targeted outreach. And that is, uh, you know, due to Nancy primarily who sends a lot of uh, outreach, a lot of personalized emails when it comes to transfer institutions that students are interested in pursuing, any events that they're hosting, uh, she, she makes sure to uh, do specific outreach. So these are some of the things that um, we've seen benefit the cohort tremendously in their retention rates. Um, and, and, you know, there's two things that we always tell um, advisors and anyone who's meeting with students to ask is what do you want to do and where do you want to transfer? Ultimately, those two questions can answer a lot uh, when meeting with students. Next, I'm going to go into breaking down what the Transfer Center does. So as mentioned earlier, we're still offering our events virtually. We have drop-ins with the colleges and universities. This is taking the place of the table visits. Uh, we also have uh, virtual fairs. Last semester we had a total of seven fairs and this semester we're going to have two, one for the state universities, one for the private. And so those are coming up shortly. We do post all of our events on social media as well as um, many other means. I'll talk about that in a minute. We also host transfer workshops, both live, but for some, for some students that cannot attend the workshops, they are pre-recorded and they are listed on our website so students can view those. And we offer instant admissions uh, opportunities uh, for students who 
um, want to get their application fee waived as well as a free train transcript if they attend an instant admissions event. Uh, they will not only get a decision on the spot, but they'll get those two things waived. And as we know, we have to provide students incentives uh, so that they can participate in events. And that was a nice thing about being in person is that we always provided them lunch while they had an information session. We provided them um, college swag. Uh, and unfortunately, we can't do that now, but you know, we still try to provide incentives for them to uh, still take advantage of the opportunities available. We also provide one-on-one -on -one um, support with students. We provide free uh, fee waivers if they are eligible, and uh, we provide assistance with selective enrollment uh, institutions, being that they go through a much more um, detailed process when it comes to uh, the application. Some of the types of things that we do to outreach uh, to connect with our students is we send out a weekly newsletter. One of the things uh, that I try not to do is overwhelm students with uh, content. I've noticed that if I send them a couple of emails a week, they start to get a little aggressive and rightfully so. So what I do is when colleges and universities reach out with you know, these great opportunities, I summarize it into a weekly newsletter that I send out every Monday. And whenever we conduct surveys, uh, I always ask, how did you hear about our events? Over 50% of students always indicate that it is through email. So this is something that they expect every week. Um, in fact, I, uh, when students reach out, they always uh, reply to one of my weekly newsletters. And so um, we also send out lar uh, text messages for large events, such as the transfer fairs. Uh, we used to do more text messaging, but now because of uh, we're in a COVID world, we understand that uh, we want to leave the text messaging for emergencies, especially if the college is doing any outreach. And so we're only leaving it to large events these days. Uh, we do provide classroom visits, uh, virtual at the time, and so if you are interested in hosting, um, having the Transfer Center come visit for five minutes, for an hour, however long you want us to be there, uh, Nancy and I are always uh, willing to, to go in. And uh, we also offer professional development for academic advisors because truthfully, they are the ones who meet with students the most. We can only meet with our cohort. I meet with some of our completers, but truthfully, we can't meet with over you know the 5,000 students that may be interested in transferring. And so for that reason, we do um, meet with advisors at least on a monthly basis to provide updates on any of the new partnerships or the Things that are trending in the world of transfer. We are available on social media, um, both on Facebook as well as Instagram. The logo switch uh, moved a little, oddly, but um, we are also uh, very present on the Triton social media. We have a large presence, presence on YouTube. All of our workshops are, are on there, so feel free to um, check us out. So I like this page because it summarizes, uh, it's, it's a page full of logos and you're thinking, what is this? Well, these are some, just some of our partnerships that we have with uh, mostly in-state institutions, but also some out of state. Now, uh, this is not exclusively the only universities that we meet with. Um, we have uh, partnered with other institutions. Um, and one of the things that I'm proud to say is we've even uh, had some traction from the Ivy Leagues. Recently, we had uh, Columbia University in New York uh, visit virtually last semester and the semester prior they were in person before uh, COVID started. And so uh, they are one of the uh, partners that we've been able to secure uh, and who constantly meets with our students to talk about the rigorous um, selective enrollment process. I just want to go into uh, more detail over the partnerships and the transfer guides that we have on campus. We have seven guaranteed admissions agreements. Uh, this guarantees a spot for students to uh, go to the institution of their choice as long as they abide by whatever requirements the university sets in place. We also have uh, six transfer pathways, which means that any community college student can participate in uh, these pathways at 
mostly the mostly these are with the uh, public universities in Illinois to ensure a seamless process. We have six university center partners. We uh, the transfer center does not oversee these partners. However, we do work closely with them um, and serve as a liaison whenever they try to add more majors. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the university center is a resource so that students can complete their bachelor's degree on Triton's campus without ever leaving to the college or university. Um, and so uh, they still have to apply to get into that university, but they can complete their degree here. And then we also have five three plus one agreements, which sound as good as it is. It's three years at Triton, one year at the university, and even that year is usually discounted with up to 20% in tuition. And so as you can see, this is a lucrative opportunity for students because they can save money, a lot of money by doing three years at Triton. Um, and all of these, by the way, are on our website, so you can see them more thoroughly because I am going really fast. <laughs> um, we also have transfer guides with 40 universities, uh, and we have over 30 two plus two agreements, which essentially is a transfer guide, but it's a little bit more ex inclusive, exclusive for Triton College. Since fall 2019, so since the transfer center opened, we have 32 new transfer guide and partnerships. Uh, we actually have 34, but only 32 of those are through the Transfer Center. And so I'm really proud of that accomplishment because uh, we want to give students more opportunities. We want to give, uh, especially now with COVID, we want students to start at Triton, save money, and then transfer seamlessly at their next institution. And um, I'm happy that these partnerships provide uh, transparency with what students are going to need. Uh, so for the transfer guides, I just want to go over the process in more detail in case there is any interest in this group on how to get these uh, transfer guides started, partnerships. So transfer guides uh, usually just require the uh, approval of a department coordinator or chair and an academic dean. No memorandum of understanding is required, uh, though MOU goes through lawyers as well as Vice President Campos, and it can be a lot more um, time consuming because there is a lot that needs to be processed. The MOUs are usually for the partnerships, and that is because they have a clause of requiring scholarships, sharing of student records, or a guaranteed admissions. Those are signed by Vice President Campos. and. Um, any uh, time we start a, one of these uh, processes, we do a lot of vetting with both institutions and Triton College faculty to make sure that we come to an agreement. And uh, lastly, I just want to highlight that I've had the pleasure of meeting many faculty during the Guided um, Pathways work. And uh, there is a lot more work to be done with these transfer partnerships, but I do want to give a shout out to a lot of our faculty, some of you might be here today, uh, who have been assisting in the process, whether it's creating more guides or um, you know, sim simply inviting these universities into your classroom uh, so that students can learn more about uh, the opportunities there. If you are interested in learning more about the partnership process or transfer guides, feel free to reach out to me. My email is listed uh, in this slide. And that is it for me because you have a lot of other great things that you're going to be um, covering today. Thank you. Uh, you're on. Yeah. Thank you, Nelly. Good job. Actually, we have a few more minutes, if you don't mind, um, in case um, our faculty have some questions for you. Yeah, I do see a, a question of um, how can students not in the cohort benefit from the transfer center? Anyone can go to the transfer center for all of the events or the partnerships. Students do not have to be in the cohort. And that's why we do our professional development with the advisors. Everything that we know about transfer, they should know as well. Um, we want to. We don't want to hoard the information. On the contrary, we want to share it so that more people are able to assist when it comes to transfer advice. Um, but this is not, um, our transfer center and events are not exclusive to the cohort. The cohort is just a pilot so that we can monitor a group of students. In fact, Nancy and I do meet with students outside of the cohort. We just ask that they meet with their advisors first. 
And I make an exception for students that are completing because I know that for them it's a little more urgent and they usually have questions that are very detailed regarding the application process. I will meet with them one on one without them being in the cohort. And in arts and sciences, we know the majority of our students are planning on transferring. I mean, we do have some CTG students as well, but so many of your students are planning on transferring to a four year university or school. Um, and we, we talk about in student engagement, we talk about getting to know your students as much as possible and what their plans are after your class and after Trenton College, just as good pedagogy, as good student engagement and, and keeping them in the course. So we would ask you, please keep in mind the transfer center, they cannot visit early or often enough um, because it's just going to show them opportunity. It's just going to benefit them in so many ways. So just please keep them in mind. And Nellie and Nancy are just incredible at what they do. And you, again, yeah, I agree. I want to thank Nellie and Nancy for the Good Work at Transfer Center. In fact, their work really cover all spectrum, our students' choices. So obviously, we reach out to a local university. But in the last year, let me highlight the fact that they have reached out to Stanford. They have reached out to Carnegie Mellon, and we are about to reach out to Yale University. So we want to be able to, you know, have a lot more choices for high-performing students to consider going forward. So great job to Nellie. Um, if I may, let's applaud for her good work. Really, really wonderful work. Thank you. Um, I know I'm getting some questions regarding flyers. Uh, I will always send those out to uh, Dean Lee and then um, and his team and, and that can always be sent out to you. Um, but yes, I, I do send out uh, the flyers to, to the deans, just to all academic deans so that it gets to all of the faculty. And you can obviously please share that with our students. Jim, a uh, little off topic, but I'm happy to uh touch base with the Dean and Student Affairs about the virtual navigators and the student mentors. Like I said, it's a little off top, but I'm happy to do that and get that information back to you. So yeah. everyone, uh, you will be uh, um, receiving the Transfer Center operating hours this term from me in a couple of weeks uh, because we're still finalizing the class assignment. Uh, once that is done, I will uh, ask for uh, email address of all arts and science faculty this term once I have that, you'll be receiving more information from me. Thank you. Thank you again, Nelly. Uh, next, let's get Derek a, a few minutes and he's gonna uh, play the video from Beth Dung uh, because the committee that Beth Dung is chairing really has a um, major um, objective, a major project in mind this year. Um, and let's um, hear from her in a few minutes. Sure, sure, yeah. Before I do that, I want to go back to what Jim asked about the virtual navigators and student mentors. I just want to let you know, coming up at 11 o'clock, you're all going to go into a big session, uh, reconvening, to talk about uh, guided pathways updates. Um, and as you all know, we're implementing guided pathways full scale in the campus uh, in fall. I am the co-chair for guided pathways pillar three, and that is academic support and connecting our students and our faculty with academic support. I have a deep background in that, so I'm really interested in it. And so the virtual navigators, student mentors, et cetera, are gonna be a big part of that, just giving you a preview. But switching gears, I'm gonna play um, Beth Dunn. She's a co-chair of our math department, and I'm gonna play her video right now, talking about uh, another issue that we have um, on the campus. Can everyone see? Is it working? Yes. Good job. Right. Yes, it's on. We're going to hope that the sound works. And uh, here we go. Hello, welcome. I'm sorry I can't be with you here today. My name is Beth Dunn. I am one of the co-chairs of the math department here at Triton College. And one of the other roles I have here at Triton College is I am chair of the Academic and Scholastic Standards Committee. What I'd like to do today is I wanted to do this very brief PowerPoint presentation regarding withdrawals and student success here at Triton College. This is a project that the ASSC has been working on uh, for a while. And I wanna present some data 
And I would also like to get some feedback from you regarding some ideas about how we can um, lower our withdrawal rate and increase student success here at Triton College. So in a national and statewide study, it was shown that Triton College ranks in the 99th percentile as far as having the highest percent rate of withdrawals. This was data that was collected in the fall of 2014. So basically, we are the worst. This data right here, this screen, shows you a comparison to, to other, our, our sister colleges. So we're comparing ourselves not nationally on this screen or on this slide, but we are comparing ourselves to our um, sister schools that are nearby. And you can see that Triton College has a 19% um, uh, withdrawal rate. And the next closest is 16%. We don't know what the rates are at these schools. We just have the, um, um, what I'm saying is we don't know which school is assigned which rate. We just know that this is our rate, 19%, and the next closest is 16%. The colleges are listed here in alphabetical order. And this also shows you, since that data was taken in 2014, this is data that Triton has collected for what's happening with withdrawals from the fall of 2015 to the fall of 2018. So these are all withdrawals, the total number of withdrawals in the fall of 2015 all the way through to the fall of 2018. What I'd like to talk about on this slide is I wanted to point out that most of the students that are assigned, or many students, I should say, that are assigned a W grade don't re-enroll in Triton College. This is an excerpt from a much larger Excel spreadsheet. And what happened is with um, the research department tracked what happens to students from the fall of 2016 to the summer of 2019. So every student that was assigned a W in the fall of, 2016, fall of 2016 were tracked for the next few semesters all the way up to the fall of, I'm sorry, to the summer of 2019. And what this research indicated is that 40% of those students that were assigned a W in the fall of 2016 did not return to Triton. Did not return to Triton. I don't mean that they didn't take that course again. I am saying that 40% of them just didn't come back to Triton at all. So we are losing those students. So a lot of instructors ex think that this W grade is a mercy grade. You know, this W is going to be better for you. It's not going to lower your... Um, GPA, but what's happening is those students are being withdrawn, are being assigned a W, and they aren't coming back to us. What I want to show you in the next slide um, is a graphic that indicates when, number one, when the students withdrew, and number two, some of the reasons why they are withdrawn. So some of the things I want to show you that I want to highlight here is I want you to look at the spikes in the instructor-initiated withdrawals because most of the Ws that are assigned are assigned by an instructor, not student-initiated. You would think that most of the students would be, um, would be withdrawing themselves from a course, but that isn't the case. Most of the Ws are assigned by the instructor. And I would like to show that to you um, on that next slide. So you can see here that there are two spikes of when instructor initiate, the, there's two spikes of when um, Ws are assigned, because these are the Ws that are assigned throughout the semester. So you can see that there's a spike right around October of 2018, and the color of this spike indicates that this is when the instructor terminates a student from a class. So that happens right about when we do those midterm verifications. So that's expected. You would expect there to be a spike there. 
And then there's another spike at the end of the semester. And this spike is when the students are assigned their final grade. So instructors are assigning a final grade of a W to the students. So, you know, there's going to be, if we're not assigning a W as the final grade, then that means that there's going to be an increase, right? If we lower the W rate, we're going to increase the level, the rate of F, Ds and Fs in our classes. And the thought process, like I mentioned before, is that an instructor thinks that they're assigning a mercy grade. Let me assign a W. This isn't going to hurt your GPA. And then you can come back. You can take this class again and get a better grade. But it's been found that these students that are going to be assigned a W, they really don't have a reason. There's no incentive for them to come back and change that W since that W isn't hurting their GPA. This is the thought process of the student. There's no incentive for them to come back and repeat that course, right? Or maybe they're afraid of the course. The data actually shows that 71% of the students that are assigned a W don't retake the class. Remember, we already said 40% are gone, right? But 71% of the students that are assigned a W don't take the course again. So that W is really not an incentive to the student. So what are some of the potential solutions to this problem of how we can lower this uh, withdrawal rate? So one of the things is to make sure we communicate with our students about the withdrawal policy. Let them know when is the last day for them to withdraw. Make this more student initiated rather than instructor initiated withdrawals. We also want to have some kind of guideline for faculty to, to follow when they are going to um, assign a W, maybe to reach out to the students um, and with some intervention tactics like retention alerts or counseling or tutoring, etc. Now the Academic and Scholastic Standards Committee has been talking about this for a long time. And the next part of this presentation is going to require some feedback from you. So I'm going to leave that to the deans to moderate. But before I leave, I wanted to invite you to join the Academic and Scholastic Standards Committee. We meet the first Wednesday of the month at 2 o'clock. And our next meeting dates are listed here, February 3rd, March 3rd, April 7th, and May 5th. So I encourage you to reach out to me if you would like to join us, um, just to share some ideas if you are excited about this work and have some great ideas of how we can um, fix some policies and some procedures here at Triton to increase student success. You are very welcome to come and join us. Please reach out to me. My email is here with any um, information in uh, definitely, if you have some ideas, please email me regarding this data that I just presented to you. So there are two questions that um, hopefully Kevin and Rick and Derek can um, moderate. And please know that I've asked them to save the chat so that I can look at all of your ideas. So I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you very much, and I hope that you have a great day and have a great start to the semester. I think that was a really, really um, great discussions, a great presentation from Beth, uh, because this initiative, Bringing the W Gray, has a lot of implications to us. Um, as institutions, as well as faculty. So let me explain. If indeed the data tells us that when students receive a W, they don't come back, we're losing enrollment. And enrollment is particularly critical right now, in my mind. With healthy enrollment, you know what it means? That we're not gonna cancel classes. We're able to give more classes to adjunct faculty. And that, you know, and more enrollment, meaning that you know, more financial stability for the institutions. So, you know, to me, it's also about student success as well. 
how can we make sure to make sure that students will continue to come back, have the greed, have the perseverance to continue in education. If 40% of them do not come back, John asked a very good questions. Where did they go? Did they say goodbye to college all, all together? Did they go to another institutions? Um, like I said, we'll be reaching out research to see what they can tell us. But you know, it is a very, very critical topic that we certainly want to hear from you. And if you have questions, you know, we'll try the best to address. Um, but also we encourage all of you to use the chat and start offering feedback for Beth and her committee uh, because your input is so critical to us. You're in a classroom, you know your students. So we'd love to hear from you in the chat. You know, whatever feedback you have, no good or bad, uh, please share in the chat room. And then give your questions, uh, happy to answer as well. Maxwell, I see that you have your hands up. Yes. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I think one of the things that is not clear here is the fact that uh, what happened before they register for that class. So how they get advised that this class is good for them. Because in my opinion, there is a rush for students to register for, for example, healthcare programs because they know that there is money there. They can find a job. But are really all these students good fit for these courses? So I had this student really three years ago. He was an artist. So the guy failed at the, I think twice failed in my class. And at the end of the second time, I said, why are you registering again? And he said, because there is no job for me. I'm an artist. I would like to get something in healthcare, but I'm an artist. Look at this. So these are the problems. I would like if this committee or these uh, 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 good job that they are doing to search about why these students disappear, withdraw, this and that. If they search about the background of these students would be good. And also, as uh, Derek said, this is a good job for uh, guided pathway people because they can focus on this part for advisory team, how they select the students or advise this student. I will go and I say, I would like to become a rocket scientist, but I'm not a fit for that program. So they say, oh, go register to this class. No, they should ask them, are you really a good fit for this program? Not just, I would like to go to this program, so go register, no. So this is something that came to my mind. Kevin, I'm, I'm gonna share, that was great, Beth. I'm gonna share Beth's the last slide here, just so we have for discussion for, um, for the next like seven, eight minutes of discussion. Okay, I see Jim, yeah. hand is up. Jim, let's hear from you as well. Jim, you're muted, I think. A couple of things. The uh, virtual navigator program I used last, no, uh, last fall was a great help, but we're out of virtual navigators. So I would love to have one for each of my classes this spring. And that would be great as far as retention, but, but you know, they're all gone. So the other thing is the student mentor system is also an excellent, uh, um, project, but uh, it would be really helpful to me if the student mentors could be a mentor for a class they haven't taken. The way it is now, they have to have taken the class and gotten an A in it, but if I'm teaching an unusual class, it's really hard to get someone who's already taken it. The other thing for me is the alert system is broken. It has been for many years. If I have a student with a problem, I put it in there, it goes into cyberspace and gets lost. I'm I, I really expect that when I say a student's got a problem, I'm handing it to a professional who's let's say a counselor or an academic advisor who will take that student and get them through what they need to get through in order to uh, retain them and for them to succeed. I don't wanna do that myself. I don't really think I should be doing that myself as the instructor. It shouldn't be my job to make sure they get what they need. I should be able to hand that off to a counselor type 
person. So thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim actually mentioned a lot of good points, you know, although um, early alert, you know, may ha had issue in the past, you know, um, but if you see, you know, students struggling, you know, it would be really, really helpful to reach out to other offices on campus, you know, based on students need um, to make sure that they have the support elsewhere as well, which is really, really critical. You know, during yesterday's discussion as well, we come to uh, understand that there seems to be a misconception that when students receiving W, it would, would not impact the financial aid. That is not true. That is not true. Students' financial aid can be impacted negatively if they're getting too many withdrawal or if their GPA uh, fall under 2.0. So the fact that, you know, I, we also understand that the flip side of a W is usually a F, right? But the F actually have the incentive to kind of force students to come back and retake the class because when students repeat a class with us, their GPA will be recalculated by letting go of the previous F grade and then using a new grade to substitute that grade in a calculation of GPA. So the grade F actually, if that's what the students earn, um, then that's ought to be on the transcript, have the power and incentive to encourage you to come back and re-enroll. And that itself means high enrollment and high retention for arts and sciences. At this time, unless I see more hands, I would like all of you to take a closer look of the slides in front of you and then use the chat uh, feature um, in the remaining uh, few minutes to offer Beth and her committee some feedback. Again, there's no good or bad idea. You know, please you know, take a look of the questions in front of you and please use the chat room to offer some input for us. Thank you very much. So let's begin. Yeah, like Kevin's talking about, we have a couple of different options here that we're looking at on the screen for how we could how we could proceed. And uh, the a bigger question about the pros and cons of implementing such a college-wide policy at all. I think another piece that really matter is the following, allows students to know their class standing at all times. Because Triton does not issue valid midterm grade, we only issue S or W, students may not know where they are, you know, and, and then be able to make the best decision, whether it's withdraw or not. So, you know, but we also have other, you know, mechanism such as Blackboard Gradebook, or, you know, from you, you know, even we are not collecting a valid midterm grade, you know, can you and midterm make sure the students know what grade they're getting at, at, you know, at midterm and then so that they can make better decisions whether to stay or to withdraw early. So um, those strategy also matter as well. Very good. Thank you for your feedback. I'm reading them and they're really, really good. Um, idea here. These are all great comments. And not expect as well, you know, many of you are helping the students, you know, um, when they tell you that they're not going to be successful, then you issue a W for them. But at the end of the day, students need to take their own academic journey, you know, and, and, and be able to, you know, uh, have the uh, efficacy to manage their own um, school task. And to me, withdrawing a class ought to be oftentimes initiated by students, although many of you are helping them, but still explaining the due date for, with, for uh, uh, initial withdrawal, you know, early on in a class, it will also help students as well. 
Many of you as well probably teach or have taught at some of the other schools, the sister schools that Beth uh, showed us in her presentation. And I'm um, sure there's some lessons that we can learn from our peers or ways that you all, um, other ways that you have seen this process play out in other places that you have taught. Well, in terms of numbers of withdrawals, we can't assign a W at my other school after it passes the withdrawal date, the official withdrawal date. So we're Good not point. So we get fewer Ws just because of that. But the problem for me with uh, students withdrawing is not that they're on top of their academic career and they're figuring out what they want to do and they decide to withdraw. Rather, they're overwhelmed with their life. They're overwhelmed with work and mental health and taking care of somebody and all kinds of different stuff. So it's someone who's really overwhelmed has been my experience. That's who's withdrawing. That's why I'm thinking, I wish a counselor could help them at that point. And maybe my logic is incorrect on that, but I don't feel like it should be me as the instructor that's helping them. They need help from someone who's trained in that who can then guide them to whatever resource they need, but I don't. I don't have the time or energy to be that guide. Definitely, I yeah. think you may. Yeah, sorry. No, you're, thanks, Kevin. I think there are two good points there. Number one, just in general, we all know as teaching community college students, they have major life commitments, and, and being flexible as an instructor is such a big part of what you all do. That said, we also know that the cases you're talking about, Jim, that's not every case. And there are some students who just let the class go or they got frustrated or whatever. And potentially, as was mentioned in the chat, those students, if, if they didn't withdraw by the withdrawal date, those students are, should probably receive an F at that point. Um, and and it's, it's on you to um, make that judgment call. Those, Let's hear from Michael and Tracy as well. I see their hands up. We have like two minutes. Yep. Uh, one of the major problems I've, I've seen in Triton College for years is that the adjuncts were required to run on Blackboard and the full-time uh, instructors never were. And so if, a, if a, an instructor is properly using Blackboard, they're going to have a running grade total all the time. And that should be... I mean, all the students deserve that. Yeah. Really, I, I don't think a teacher should really be teaching college and not give the student a running grade to told. That student should know where they're at 24 seven in the class. I agree, and, I agree uh, wholeheartedly. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's a union thing with the full-time instructors, but this is a little bit of different situation. And people are, are running courses courses online and I withdrew more students this uh, this past uh, semester at Triton because of COVID because I had to give them a break so I don't think the instructors it's not a matter of instru instructors shouldn't be allowed to uh, uh, not withdraw their students you, that's a fail safe for the students I mean you you know your students you know what their grades are you know what they've been doing. I mean, it, and and if they contact you, you you can send them to a counselor. Run them through the counselor. There, there's a lot of help in student. There's there's help in student services. Thank you. Let's give let's give Tracy the last word here. Give her hand up. Thank you, Michael. Please. Oh, I always love to have the last word. That's fantastic. Uh, just to follow up with Jim Ellison said. Uh, you know, none of the other schools I teach at allow the instructor to give the students a W at all. I mean, uh, Harper College, Oakton, Moraine Valley, none of these schools were allowed to just drop our students. Like, if you aren't doing the work, man, and I reach out to you and say, hey, you know, like, just wanted you to know you missed, you know, this assignment, this assignment, this assignment, you know, you can only do that so many times. Mm -hmm. So they got to be, you know, they got to give a darn. And, and so, you know, and, and that's the thing, you can encourage them and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm trying to throw you a bone or help you out or whatever the case is. And if those students uh, have to go see an advisor before they drop the class, guess what? They're not gonna drop the class. There'll be a whole lot more Fs and there will be 
uh, a lot less W's uh, if, if we insisted that they went and saw an academic advisor. They should have the luxury of not having to do that. You know. That was great, Tracy. Thank you, everyone.